that. So be sure you're paying um, a lot of attention. And um, you might want to also find out about some of the maps that he's very known for putting on the topographic maps, putting into um, place in the school systems. I don't think they'd be there without him, would they? So um, I would like you to give a warm welcome to Dr. Kirkby. OK. I think they promised the uh, turn it on back there. So uh, I like uh, the university I teach, uh, the introductory courses. And I got into the university, or I got into geology originally, via dinosaurs. Uh, when I was seven years old, and this was you didn't know about dinosaurs, it was absolutely hooked. Uh, I like these, are my second best favorite animals. I sort of enjoy the uh, megafauna. Megafauna is just a fancy word for big animals. It makes you sound more scientific if you say megafauna than big animals. But what we have right now going on is a big animal extinction that's been taking place. So another big word you don't have to worry about, but I just never realized that cave paintings, they have another word for it. They call it parietal art. So if you want to be fancy and try and impress people, you can call them parietal art. But the thing about cave paintings is that they're found inside caves across Eurasia. And these things are just magnificent at times. The oldest ones uh, were found in Spain. They're dating back to about 66,000 years ago, which really, when you think about it, it's neat. What it means is that these are the handprints of Neanderthals. So you actually have the handprint, the impression of Neanderthals from over 60,000 years ago on it. But when modern humans arrived thousands of years later, a lot of the cave painting ended up becoming much more focused on animals. And these things are sometimes just exquisitely done. I mean, the artwork is beautiful. They're completely nicely, random, uh, naturally drawn on it. Uh, they're also remarkably accurate. Uh, just recently, uh, these were various paintings of horses inside some of the caves across Europe. where well, they did DNA from horse remains of fossil horses, and from the DNA and from what we know about modern horses, it ends up that these would have been the colors of the horses that were out there, and they match up just to all the colors of the paintings within the cave. So they actually were very accurate on this. But the thing that's haunting about this is that when you look at these things, some of the animals seem very familiar, but others don't. And when you think about it, it's a little bit discouraging to realize how many of the animals out there inside these cave paintings no longer exist. So the ibex inside the front, that still exists in the Alps. That one's still around. But the other ones in the background, we don't have mammoths any longer. We also don't have cave lions across Europe. These are not African lions. These are cave lions, an entirely different species. They're gone. Uh, Megalosaurus is gone, which is quite often called the Irish elk, but it's really a deer, it's not an elk on it. But, uh, you know, this was a big form with huge horns. It's in the cave paintings, but it's no longer out there inside nature. The woolly rhinoceros actually did survive a little bit longer. It probably died out only about 10,000 years ago. And we had these characters, the aurochs, which are the ancestors of domestic cattle. They were bigger, wider horns and things like that. But they existed all the way up until 1627 inside forests inside Poland before they died out. And they're also displayed inside Minoan art. So when you look at some of the art of the world, uh, you still have sort of wisps and memories of some of these animals that are gone. But the sad part is that over the last 50,000 years, the loss of species that we've seen on Earth is actually one of the six largest mass extinctions on Earth. Now, most people when they hear of mass extinctions, they think of the loss of the dinosaurs. Well, that was back there at the end of the Cretaceous. That was actually a relatively minor one compared to this one back here in the Permian, was much, much uh, more of a loss there. But we've had six, five big extinctions in the fossil record, and now we have one that we're living through right now. And that's, uh, you know, a little bit disconcerting. The other thing that's different about the mass extinction right now is that it's specifically targeting large animals. And that's very different than all the other mass extinctions. The one at the end of the, of the Cretaceous when it killed the dinosaurs, well, dinosaurs died out, the non-avian ones, the birds are still around, but so did a lot of other animals. Small things died out, uh, you know, all sorts of crocodiles, birds, even plankton inside the ocean died out. But here we're talking about, this is inside South America. These are the forms that lived in South America up until about 20,000 years ago. But of all these things, only the ones in color still survive. 
all the rest of them have been lost. So this extinction is really hitting big animals. It's not hitting the whole spectrum of all the animals. It's not hitting the whole ecosystem. It's just hitting big animals in particular. And that extinction didn't occur at the same time everywhere, which is also different than many of these other mass extinctions. They were global events that hit every continent, every area at roughly about the same time. This one is spread out. So what we find is that it first began in Africa about 120,000 years ago, but it wasn't all that bad. We had 100% of the species up there and then it drops down a little bit, but we still have pretty good numbers going across. But when you get to Australia, when it hits, it's hit really hard. It's hit a little bit later at a different time, but we end up losing most of the big animals inside Australia. In North America, it's only 13,000 years ago that this happens, and again, we lose most of the big animals that are out there. And Madagascar's only began about 2,000 years ago, which when you think about it means that this mass extinction of all the Madagascar big animals off the coast of uh, Africa occurred at the same time that Augustus Caesar was ruling the Roman Empire. And when you look at the smaller things that actually came off inside New Zealand's, well, their giant birds died out during the time of the Black Plague in Europe. They didn't die of Black Plague, uh, but just the same timing. But some of these extinctions are coming up right up into historic times on this sort of thing. Now, the African and Southern Eurasian megafauna, well, they had evolved alongside humans. So they seem to have been affected the least out of all these. They grew up with humans, they evolved with humans, and so having humans around didn't seem to bother them. But Australia had not had any connection. The animals living there had been on their own until humans showed up sometime a while back. We're not exactly sure of when humans got to Australia yet. We're still arguing this. So some people say it was about 47,000 years ago. Others say it was a little bit earlier. Some people pushed a little bit back. But all of the big animals die out about 46,000 years ago. Shortly after the closer end of that, if humans showed up by 47, they die out right very quickly. If they showed up a little bit earlier, it took a while before they died out. But we still see that they die out there. And they had all sorts of big animals. This just is a kangaroo. It sort of looks like a modern day kangaroo. But you look at the face, it's a short face kangaroo. And it's actually pretty big. You know, if you're talking about something that was about 510 pounds. So this is a good size kangaroo on it. They had other things that were even bigger, uh, getting up all the way to 6,000 pounds. And these things were big enough and they were herd animals, so they actually are also the only marsupial that we know was migratory. It had to move around because a herd of these would eat everything inside their environment that they could possibly eat. In fact, in areas where they had to keep moving and keep moving around. But Tasmania, down here off the coast of Australia, well, their megafauna dies out 6,000 years later. So they die out. Everything on the island, on Australia, died under 47,000 years. On Tasmania, it's 6,000 years later. Only after sea level drops because of the growth of the ice sheets, that it drops the sea level enough that you actually have, this would have all become solid land going out there, and people could just simply walk from Australia to Tasmania. And then, very quickly, everything that's living on Tasmania, the big animals, all die out just about the time that humans show up. Now, Japan even had its own megafauna animals on it. Uh, it had elk that were really big size. It even had the equivalent of mammoths, but had elephants out on Japan until humans arrived about 30,000 years ago, and these all disappear there as well. Humans made it to North America about 13,000 years ago, and again, everything changes when humans show up inside the picture. Uh, we used to have all these sort of things, giant ground sloths, big, huge animals coming through, uh, mammoths, mastodons, a whole host of other things out there, including our own short-faced bear over there. Uh, but 25,000 years ago, the white-tailed deer that you see inside Minnesota forests, they were the 29th largest animal in North America. Well, now they're the ninth. The other 20 species have all been lost. So all this sort of happens relatively quickly. And 500 years later, when humans make it to South America, again, we find that a lot of the big animals die out, and we only have a few that manage to survive into the modern. Now, islands continued the pattern, but quite often with mini megafauna. Now, that literally means little big animals, which is why we like to use megafauna, because we can say the most ridiculous things and still sound like we're being scientific at the time. Uh, but these are just small versions of the big mammoths. 
Uh, but this is not a baby elephant. That is not a baby hippopotamus. Those are adult members comparing a hippopotamus out on the island to the ones that you find inside Africa and comparing a mammoth on the island to a human out there. But inside Cyprus, we end up with humans and extinction both arrive about 10,000 years ago. And so we lose things there as well. The very last mammoths we had in the world lived on Wrangell Island, which is an island off the coast of Siberia. And so it's right up here, just off in that area. They lived there until about 35,000 years ago, and they die out when evidence of the Inuit, uh, what quite often are called Eskimos, but when the Inuit show up, uh, they die out. Now, in this case, they may have already been on the decline before humans showed up on it. But still, when you think about that, that means that when those mammoths were living on that island, well, if you consider when they died out, the Great Pyramids in Egypt were already 1,000 years old. They weren't just built, they were 1,000 years in the past. And we had mammoths uh, living up until that time. Now, climate was also changing, so scientists have to sort of figure out, well, what was the dominant thing? Was it just humans or was it climate? Because big animals might be susceptible to climate change. So this is all the percent, the colors, the red is where you had most of the animals lost, and so really big uh, losses there. The blue are the less affected on it. Well, when you look at the number of species, this is about the same thing as up there, but we just want to keep it on the same scale. So you compare it to temperature change. And you find, well, the temperature changes really were pretty heavy across Eurasia out there, but there wasn't as much as well as the species dying off. South America didn't have much temperature change at all, but yet it had a terrible extinction rate. So that doesn't seem to match up. Precipitation is another possibility. Here, South America had big changes in precipitation and it had big extinctions. But again, look at Eurasia up in here. The really the biggest changes in precipitation, and yet there's really very little change inside the loss of species. But when you look at it from the point of view of when did humans show up on these different areas, all of a sudden the pattern seems to fit a little better. Humans started in Africa, where we evolved with these species. They were used to us. Uh, as a result, there wasn't as many losses there. As they spread out, the areas that they reached ended up seeing the ones that were most isolated ended up seeing the greatest species loss. So it seems that if we're trying to find someone guilty on this, it's probably us, pretty strong. But now how could people do this? I mean, before technology, I mean, when you think about it now, if you want to kill an animal, you can do it all sorts of different ways. You can shoot it, you could poison it, you could change its environment. But how did they do this inside the past when they only had very primitive uh, tools on it and when they had much lower populations? But the catch is the animals are susceptible for this. The big animals tend to be what they call in biology K strategists, which means that they keep their population about up to the carrying capacity, the maximum that the environment can handle. But they don't end up just like having tremendous numbers of young. They actually have only a very few young, quite often even only one young, and they pour all their effort into trying to take care of that young, or maybe one or two young, but they try and take as care of a lower number of young, and get them a better chance of surviving to adulthood. Other animals do it differently. They just have tons of kids and they hope that some of them make it there, but they don't really care, don't put a lot of investment or time into it. But for these big animals, they tend to actually take care of their young. So they have long lives, very slow population growth and low death rates. And when you're talking about the adults, there's very seldom predators that can actually kill the adults. They can only kill the young. Well, this is a fantastic strategy and it works well as long as you have nice, stable environments. But when you introduce something new into an environment, like humans into an environment where hadn't been there before, it's no longer stable. And so these things are very vulnerable to human hunting. And mathematical models suggest that even small numbers of humans moving into a new continent uh, could re end up basically wiping out the megafauna within a few centuries on it, just by killing a few a year because it takes them so long to try and recover. So they have very slow population recovery rates, so you can kill them faster than they can recover. Now, when you're talking about most other predators, there is a limit as to how much you can end up eating. I mean, if wolves wipe out all the white-tailed deer in an area, the wolf population also drops because they no longer have the white-tailed deer to eat. The catch with humans, though, is that we have such a wide range of possible prey because we're using tools that any one particular prey type is expendable. If you wipe out mammoths, it doesn't hurt your society as long as you have bison 
to hunt. If you wipe out bison, it doesn't hurt your society as long as you have other things to hunt. But we can actually, we're about the only predator out there that can afford to actually wipe out part of their prey because we have this very wide resource base so we can switch this around. So it seems like humans have been responsible for the loss of many large species that no living person has ever seen. And you could say, so what? I mean, if you don't care about it or anything else, you can still say, well, what difference does it make? We never knew them, they're gone, does it really make any difference? But the catch is, these large animals have a huge impact on the environment in which they live. In uh, Africa, there are entire ecosystems that follow in the wake of elephant herds. As the elephants go through, they do so much destruction as they feed that all new plant species come in after them. The elephants are sort of like the wildfires of a Minnesota forest, that it burns through the undergrowth and lets other things come in its path. And the bison that were out on North American plains, they didn't live on the plains, they built the plains, yeah. Uh, the echo, I'm not sure if they can handle that the back there or not, if they can lower it a little bit. All right, is that better? Or the same thing? I'm not sure. I don't know, is this one even on? I think they switched over to the lavier. But these, does seem like we have maybe spots. <laughs> but the bison actually created the environment that they're in. They keep the prairies from becoming woodlands by eating all the trees, all the young shoots of trees. So as a result, when we wiped out the bison in order to basically wipe out the American Plains Indians, we also destroyed the prairies. About half of the prairies were converted to agricultural fields. The other half just became woodlands though, as saplings and other trees and shoots came out and covered the landscape. So this is a crater inside Australia, and before humans arrived and before the megafauna extinction, this area used to have a rainforest system. So we look across this, and this used to look like a nice rainforest out there. But after humans arrived and after the big animals died, you ended up with instead sort of sparse woods that were fire adapted. Now how would this happen? Well, there's not much evidence for climate change on this. Uh, instead, what it seems is that by losing all the big herbivores that were out there eating the grass, doing things, uh, and eating all the plants that were out there, you ended up increasing the fuel loads on the landscape, and as a result, you had far more fires taking place. Without the big animals eating all the plants, the plant debris just built up on the landscape and made it easier that then fires would come in and sweep across the area. And the reason why I point that out is because we see the same sort of thing inside other areas as well. Now this is actually fungal spores, and these fungal spores are actually coming from the droppings, uh, the feces of the large herbivores out there. And so when we look inside lake sediment studies, we can look at the distribution of these things through the lake sediments to give us some idea of how many big animals were living out there at the time and what other types of animals were out there. And so these show that the megafauna actually died out about 41,000 years and it was actually a century later before the fires began. And the important thing there is it's saying that it's the loss of the animals that's changing the ecosystem, rather than the plants changing first and then you losing the animals afterwards. It's actually the loss of the animals that's driving the changes on it. And this is the same thing we see in Indiana, inside some lake deposits there. And this is a really complicated diagram, so let's just fade it out for a moment. Basically, this is going to be the older layers down there, that younger one there. So they're looking at all the mud within the bottom of the lake, and they're looking at the things that are within the mud. And this column over here, these are these fungal spores that are coming from the droppings of the big animals. And so when there's a lot of them, there's a lot of big animals. When they drop down, there's very few animals. So basically, that seems to be the time when all these big animals died in Indiana. So these are the ones that they died. But when you look at that line, this extinction line, and go across, and you look at these, these are all the pollen records of other plants that are out there, and all these changes take place at the same line. With the big animals gone, all of a sudden we see these things become very abundant afterwards and building up. Other things are dropping off. This first one over here drops off. But as a result, after a while of all this uh, plants changing, all of a sudden we get this black line over here. This is the fire charcoal. And so this is when the fires are coming through and leaving charcoal inside its wake. So we're getting a whole change inside the wildfires across this area, but it comes after the big animals have already died out. Now what else? Well, 
any of you who like guacamole? Well, the avocado that we use to make guacamole, if you like this stuff, you actually owe it to the giant ground sloths because they were the only animals that were big enough that they could swallow the seeds of the avocado plant and the seeds could pass through the digestive system and come out the other end without necessarily all being broken down. So the giant ground sloths would eat a whole bunch of seeds. Some of them they would digest and the others would go right through their system and come out, but they had moved around in the meantime, so they're dropping the seeds someplace else and the avocado plants can grow. When we wiped out the giant ground sloths, the avocados were in trouble. They needed a new hero and they got one. Jaguars stepped up. The only thing that is not meat that jaguars will eat are avocado seeds. They like the right pulp around it, and so they will eat this. And so jaguars managed to help avocados limp along for a while until finally we got a bunch of bald bipedal apes that came in and started planting them inside orchards and making guacamole out of them. Uh, but, you know, there are lots of plants out there that had problems when these big animals disappeared. This is one that's called the Thaggy orange tree. It has really big seeds. It used to be widespread all across the southern states, but in the years, in the thousands of years since the megafauna disappeared, it's now actually only found in like two places within Texas on it, and its range is all reduced because there's no big animals moving the seeds around. So without megafauna to move these seeds, uh, most of the seeds just simply rot on the ground in the shade of the tree of the parent that dropped them or they're eaten up by rodents. And of course, when rodents eat seeds, the seeds don't sprout. The only way the seeds can sprout from the big animals is because they haven't actually been digested. They've gone through the whole system. So the other possibility is that you simply remain on the tree until they're really basically uh, rotting. So without megafauna, the only hope for large seeds is just random chance. Does the seed roll down a hill, drop into a stream, and float away someplace else? or possibly forgetful rodents, that they stash it in some place, mean to come back and eat it later and forget all about it. But this is not a healthy way for these plants to try and uh, reproduce uh, without the big megafauna. So we changed a whole bunch of things about the plant community. But we also changed nutrient transport within a system. Big animals eat a lot of food. They then take it and they end up putting out a lot of dung and they drop it into other areas. And they chew plants up and so they actually recycle plants and they move it around a whole lot. Well, these are things, baboons, black crakes, they're actually going through the elephant dung, breaking it apart and trying to get the food. And I actually was involved in scouting for a number of years, but one of my students many years ago was an East African scout. And he always told me that, well, when you're in East Africa, they always tell you if you're lost, follow the elephant trails. And you follow the elephant trails, not because they're gonna take you back to civilization, but because you can always find good fresh fruit along elephant trails because the tree, elephants take everything off the tree and only half of it you know, is digested, the other half ripens in their uh, gut, gets pushed out inside their dung, and if you follow along in elephant trails, you can kick the dung apart and you always find good food. So this is the way that you try doing it if you got lost. These animals knew that as well, so they're doing it already, and that sort of thing. But what it meant is that inside South America, in the Amazon basin, when they've done studies, what it's shown is that when the big animals died out, nearly all the lateral movement of nutrients uh, you know, across broad areas dropped down precipitously. It all became very local. So the nutrients are just staying in the same place. They're not being transported and moved across whole areas. Now, if we want a lesson from the distant past, the Permian mass extinction was the absolute worst mass extinction we have any fossil record of. 96% of all the things living in the ocean died out. At least 70% of all the things living on land died out as well. So this is much worse than the Cretaceous extinction. Now, it occurred on the United Pangaea. This is back when Pangaea was all together, all the continents were one huge supercontinent, and it was triggered by massive volcanic eruptions that formed what's called the Siberian Traps. But every area inside you know, Russia that's covered by the uh, maroon up there was actually buried by lava flows up to about eight kilometers thick, so several miles of lava coming out. This is a huge volcanic eruption at the time. It changed the atmosphere. It changed the chemistry of the oceans. You had this huge die-off. But as bad as this all was, it wasn't just volcanism that made this extinction so deadly. It was Pangaea itself. Because everything had been connected into one large continent, a single supercontinent means that you have a global land community, which means that you actually have low biodiversity. 
you don't have as many species because everything is living part of the same community. You don't have separate communities on each continent. Well, as a result, with lower biodiversity, you have more vulnerability to stress events. So if you're going to have a mass extinction, having lots and lots and lots of species increases the chance that some of them will make it through whatever is happening that's bad. If you have relatively low numbers, it means it can be much worse, that you can end up killing a lot of things. The modeling that we have suggests that if we were to combine all the continents again back into another supercontinent, we'd only be able to handle about two-thirds of all the mammal species we have today. And because birds can fly around and cover larger distances, we could only have half the number of birds that we have today. Now, why do we care about this? Well, the catch is we're recreating Pangaea. We're not doing it by plate tectonics. We're doing it by planes and by ships. We're moving things around. And with invasive species moving around, we really are reconnecting everything into one large community on it. So as transportation builds a global society, it also connects all these land systems. We move things in, like zebra mussels, into Lake Superior. We move all sorts of things around, and as a result, we end up decreasing biodiversity. Again, if you remember, if we do this, we are actually going to get in our position where we can only have two-thirds of the mammals and only half the birds the world has right now, just on this alone. But the catch is, it's not alone by itself. That decrease to biodiversity makes things more vulnerable to other stresses like climate change. So as a result, we actually could be facing making things even worse. We've lost a lot of big animals inside the past, but now we're in the position where we begin to start to lose the small animals as well. And so this comes up to a lesson from the more recent past. This is my mother's family, and my family would quite often skip generations a little bit. That's my grandfather up here, and he was older when my mom was born. Uh, he was about 60 years old when my mom was born. Then my mom, because of World War II, was 36 before I was born. So if you talk to most people that are my age, and you say, well, you know, how old was your grandfather or grandmother, they usually say they were born around 1900, a few years before, a few years after. My grandfather was actually born at the end of the American Civil War. So he was, uh, you know, we skipped things a little bit further. But he literally saw things that no living person has ever seen. And I don't just mean the individuals or anything else. I mean the nature that he hunted in and he fished in, the things that he liked are completely different than they are now. He saw flocks that darkened the sky. And when you read this inside the old literature, realize one thing. If you don't remember anything else from tonight, realize they were being literal. They're not being poetic. These bird flocks were out there were so thick in the bird flocks that they actually shielded the sunlight. They darkened the sky in this. One of these passenger pigeon flocks that was in 1886 when my grandfather was 18, flying all over Ontario, Canada, it was a mile wide and 300 miles long. It took 14 hours to fly overhead. And it was so thick inside the birds, it literally did block out the sun over most of that. It was like the heavy clouds that passed overhead. It took, you know, three billion birds of doing this. Well, three billion birds is about a little bit less than what we have on the entire continent today. And here it was inside just one flock. And for even more recent, this is me when I was younger with my first rock collection, uh, starting to be a geologist out there. Uh, but when I was a kid, there was a whole lot more birds than there are now. And when I was a kid, there was no point as I trying to sleep past 6.30 or 7 in the summer because you were woken up. Even in the house, even with the windows shut, the birds were so loud outside that you still heard it. Well, you can open your windows inside Minnesota, you know, these days, and you can sleep past this. You know, the bird song isn't as loud. And this we've been doing for a long time. Back inside 1750, settlers along the East Coast told a visiting biologist that they, you know, the birds were not nearly as abundant now as they had been inside their own childhood, and they remember hearing the same thing from their own parents. So this is generations of generations we've been saying that these things are actually getting less and less, and it's time we pay a little bit of attention to this. But the World Wildlife Federation, 2018, uh, October 30th, they put this out that the vertebrate population in the world has dropped in natural, I mean, this is not all vertebrates, this is not the domestic animals, but the wild animals have dropped by over 50% since 1970, which means that when I was in high school, we had twice as many animals in the world as we have now. And so we are losing a lot of things on this. 
and only a quarter of the planet's land is currently free from human impact, only a tenth will be inside another couple of decades on this. And so this is something that the rate of extinction we have now is 100 times to 1,000 times higher than what would be if we didn't have the human pressures on it. So it's something that we need to be aware of this and try and do something. In geology, we actually call this period of time now as a new name. Instead of being the Holocene, instead of being the Quaternary, we're calling it the Anthropocene, but the age of humans, the age where humans are making the major impact on the Earth. The catch of the fear I have is that maybe really should be called the Anthropozoic because it's maybe not a period. This extinction is so large at this point that instead of being something like the Cretaceous to the Tertiary, we're talking about the change from the Paleozoic to the Mesozoic to the Cenozoic. But we're embarking on a new thing, and the real challenge you have inside your lives is trying to make sure we don't do this. Try and keep it down to you know, the level of a lower one, because we are losing too many things too fast out there. And that's a really depressing thought for an evening inside Minnesota on a Monday, but it's something we have to be aware of, and you have to you know, realize inside your lifetime the decisions that are going to be made are going to be the things that will determine this. So that's all I had for right now. I thought after the break we can come back and instead have a little bit more fun looking at just megafauna and myths instead, but somehow how some of these fossil things have actually had a play within some of our legends, some of our uh, myths that we've had from the past. But Okay, now we'll open up for some yeah. questions. Are Any you... questions? And I'll bring the mic to you, okay? Did you really live in a lion's cave? Uh, yes, mountain lion's cave uh, for a few years. Can you tell them just a little bit about that? Uh, when I was doing my master's thesis, I went out to the Guadalupe Mountains in West Texas, and uh, I had never been in the desert before, and I fell in love with it. So I went out there, and uh, I was working by myself back there, but I ended up trying to find a base camp. I found a mountain lion's cave on the west face of the Guadalupe Mountains. It was up above 1,500 feet of cliffs, and there's another 1,500 feet behind me, but it had a beautiful western view, uh, and so nice rock out in front so I could watch the sunset at night. The mountain lion came back every once in a while and would scream at the front of the cave, and as long as I yelled back, she went off and found a different cave. She had several out there, but I actually, you know, I consider I was only there for about three years, but I sort of considered growing up inside a mountain lion's cave. Those were the three years that made some of the most difference in my life. But okay, that's we where have I a question from. over here. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> what were the eight other animals after the white-tailed deer? I'm sorry, mean, what was that? You said that the white-tailed deer were, Oh, the other, the other animals that, uh, we had all sorts of other animals, but they were all basically wiped out by humans on a human hunting coming in. So there was mammoths, mastodons, uh, big, you know, uh, short-faced bears, all sorts of things in there. But the other 29 species, uh, we all basically hunted to extinction. Oh, you mean what are the other animals that are as, you know, the, uh, bigger than the white-tailed deer? Uh, would be things like bear, uh, moose, uh, elk, you know, all those are, we've got about eight animals that are bigger than white-tailed deer in North America, uh, but the rest of them are, the other 20 that we had before, we've all lost those. Okay, Dr. Griffin, we have another question here. Feel free to take questions uh, here. How could we slow down the uh, extinction of the animals? I'm sorry, I've got a uh, hearing loss, so I, I missed that myself. Can you repeat? Yeah, sure. How can we slow down the extinction oh, of the animals? Oh, how can we slow it down? Uh, there's a whole bunch of things uh, that you can do on it, but none of them are particularly easy. Uh, one is you have to stop invasive species. You have to be a little bit more aware of bringing these things in. Uh, you have to be willing to try and stop them from moving into new areas on it. The major loss of species we have today, the biggest loss is landscape use. We actually change the land, we change the habitat. So we sort of have to change our behavior as well and try and at least keep some areas relatively pristine. And one of the important things is not fragment it. When you have a big forest and you put a whole bunch of roads through it, you break that forest up and it's no longer as effective for the animals that live there. So you actually have to have large areas that you sort of try and leave undeveloped. But habitat loss is the number one thing that's killing species. The second thing, though, are invasive species, that other things come in and take over in an area on it. And we do that a lot uh, with all sorts of things. You know, we bring in 
One of the examples inside northern Minnesota is that we brought in earthworms into the northern forest inside Minnesota. And you sort of think, well, earthworms, those can't be bad. They do good inside gardens. But the catch is the ice ages had actually eradicated, wiped out all the earthworms inside the northern landscape. And when the ice retreated and the new forest came in, the boreal forest that formed had a very thick organic layer because there weren't any earthworms. So all the organic material built up on the bottom and all sorts of plants and animals began to rely on that organic material. When we started bringing earthworms, just tossing them out after fishing trips and things like that, uh, the earthworms churned through all that organic material and wipe it out. And as a result, all those plants and all those animals that relied on the organic material are also wiped out. So we basically have to watch our own behavior on it. And it's not an easy thing to do, but it's something that we have to put a higher priority on it than what we've done in the past or else we're going to lose what we still have left. Okay, we have one here. Uh, how did, uh, like, big ocean predators disappear? Like, take, for example, the megalodon. Uh, megalodon, uh, we're not exactly sure. The, uh, for the big ocean predators, so the question was, you know, on landscape, you can see where it's pretty easy for humans to wipe out the big animals. But out inside the ocean, how we did it, we didn't do it by hunting. Those are dying by some other reason instead. For the megalodon, it was further in the bass. It wasn't the same time as this, but we ended up losing that when we lost a number of whales uh, species as well because that's what they were feeding on. But it's a good question. I don't really know the answer, but there isn't, doesn't seem to be one tie for all of the things that are out inside the marine system. Nowadays, though, we are overfishing. And so at this point, a lot of the marine systems are being dangerously overfished. And what we're finding is that most of the fish they're catching are actually not adults. They're the sort of the young. They aren't the older adults any longer because we've already fished those out. So we've got some problems now going on in the marine systems that are pretty strong. But for the old ones, we didn't, uh, the human activities didn't result in the deaths of Megalodon and some of the other ones. Those actually came out on natural causes. There's always some background extinction taking place, but just individual species. A mass extinction is when you have the rates so high that a whole lot of things are going at once. Um, so is the, so like, is the elephant basically in the mammoth family? Oh, elephants are mammals, yeah. And so almost all of these, the megafauna we we're talking about, they're all within the elephant, uh, sorry, within the mammal uh, species. We're so not talking about So the mammoth about is related to the elephant. Mammoths, mastodons, elephants are all sort of same of the same lines, but the mammoths and the mastodons were adapted to uh, further away, higher, the mammoth in particular to colder species, the mastodon to forest area. But we have them all across, uh, they made it into North America when uh, uh, the Bering Straits were exposed, and they made it to South America relatively recently. But elephants all came out of Africa, along with the great apes. But a lot of the other African things that you think of being African, like giraffes, rhinos, uh, lions, well, those all came into Africa about 12 to 15 million years ago when Africa connected with Eurasia. So elephants and great apes got out, everything else came in. Okay, here we go. Um, so what if, what if humans never evolved from apes and, and so we didn't ever interfere and, and would there be as many extinctions as there is now and would there be more and would there, there and do you think it would be, and do you think that, um, that the, that it would be better for, for some of the animals or, or if there's some animals that, that have been affected well by humans? Uh, it's a really good question on it. So what well, the question was, if humans didn't exist, you know, if we had never come in, uh, would this extinction have occurred? And the answer, the quick, easy answer is that if they're right about the causes of this, no, none of this extinction would have occurred. We wouldn't have had it. When we talk about invasive species, humans are actually the most successful invasive species we have. We spread out of Africa and we spread everywhere inside the world and our technology allows us to basically take the climate of Africa and move it out of every place else. There's a reason why you guys, your parents or you, all have, you know, your house is set to about the same range of temperatures. It's the average temperature to Africa where we grew up, you know, where we originally evolved. So yes, uh, it would be, but when you're asked the second part of your question is, would it be better for animals if we weren't around? It depends on which voting block you're talking about, uh, like so much inside life. For most of the animals, like the big megafauna, they would have all said, yes, it would have been a far better world if humans had never shown up. 
But there are some animals that actually have done very well because of humans, and that's the domesticated animals. Their numbers have increased tremendously. So if you ask the cows, uh, if you ask the dogs, the cats, and if you even ask some of the other species that have tagged along with us that we don't normally think about, but if you ask rats, uh, rats, cats, dogs, cattle, they would all say, this is the best of all possible worlds. This is wonderful. They like humans being around, and they've done very well. Uh, in a natural setting, there was probably an order of half a million wolves inside North America. So half a million wolves in North America. We have over 80 million dogs just inside the lower 48 states of the United States. So we have greatly increased the number of dogs inside the world compared to what a natural population would be. So they sort of like us. There's a reason why we get along well with dogs. But other species would probably prefer that we had not come along. What skull is that up there? That one is going to be the cave bear skull. Uh, but that's actually going to be one of our ones because we turned it into something else. And uh, we actually, my wife is going to be, in our family, Duane, I'm here in the front row, she takes care of all the cats, all the kids, and all the cave bears. So she has the cave bear skull down here. So if you want to come down and see the cave bear skull, you can on the break in between. But that's a cave bear. But it, Okay, here I see one. So do you think that the animals that are going extinct would be safer in zoos or be put in the wild? It depends on, the question is, are the animals that are now facing extinction would be better off inside zoos uh, or in the wild? And it depends entirely upon which animals, again. Uh, some animals do all right inside zoos. The problem is that zoos can never have the numbers. You know, we don't have enough zoos. We can't have the huge numbers. But things like the big cats, they're sort of like your own house cat. I mean, they don't mind spending all day sleeping and then, you know, having food brought to them. Uh, they do all right. But other animals, uh, especially migratory ones, elephants, it's a terrible thing to put an elephant inside a zoo. They have to have large ranges. When you see an elephant in the zoo, it's not a good thing on it. Usually, quite often, you'll see the elephant is just swinging its head back and forth. That's basically a sign of insanity within the elephants, that they don't do well. So some animals are better adapted for zoos than others. In general, I mean, it would always be nice if you had a perfect world, you'd want them all to be out safely inside nature on it, uh, inside large enough numbers. But there are some animals that probably the only way they will survive is if we put them on zoos and game preserves because their natural habitat is under so much pressure. I mean, it's an easy thing to say, well, we have to change our behavior. But the problem is we have reasons why we are behaving this way. A lot of times it's population, uh, just the huge numbers, and it's very difficult to change our behavior. Inside some parts of the world, especially in the areas where they don't have much money, they don't have as many options to try and change their behavior. And inside those areas, probably the only way these animals will make it is inside some sort of a game park or a zoo. So what factors affect the carrying capacity? Uh, so that's just affecting the carrying capacity of environment into their multitude of all sorts of them. It's how much production is out there, how many predators are out there, how many of your own you know, uh, members are out there, uh, how things change. But there's a lot of different things, and the carrying capacity is unique to each species within an environment. There's not one carrying capacity for all, because you're affecting your environment as well when you're living out there. Uh, hopefully it wouldn't come to this, but do you think it would be possible for humans to live without relying on any animals if we had the planet to ourselves? Uh, we'll never have the planet to ourselves because there's always other things out there, uh, you know, on it, uh, including all the things that sort of live with us. But I, we're, we're talking about science fiction at this point. Your guess is really as good as mine. Uh, I suppose that there would always be some way you can do it, but I would argue that I'm not sure there would be a way that would be worth living. I mean, a, a world without these other animals in it is a very shallow, very gray world. Uh, it's not one I would want to be in uh, myself. I think technically it might be possible, but I sh would not wish that on anybody at all. Okay, we have time for one more question. 
How did animals and dinosaurs come to life? How did, uh, I'm sorry, what is that? How did animals and dinosaurs come to life? Come to life? Yeah. Oh, originally, Ralph? Uh, how did animals and dinosaurs come to life? The same way that all these other ones uh, did as well. Uh, it's just that for the bigger ones, quite often they had to have a niche opened up, some sort of thing that they could do. So dinosaurs, all those big, wonderful dinosaurs with the long necks, big tails, all that sort of stuff, they all evolved out of very small bipedal predators that were sort of like, you think of a crocodile rearing up on its hind legs and living very effectively, but they were only about, you know, say so high, you could easily pick them up and carry them around, except that they probably would disembowel you while you were doing that. Uh, but, you know, they weren't big things at all. But all dinosaurs evolved from these small bipedal predators. But then as they began to adapt, they began to get larger in some areas. But the thing that really helped the dinosaurs out was another extinction event. There was an extinction at the end of the Triassic that wiped out a lot of the big animals that lived on the land at that time, and it freed up those environments for other big animals to begin to evolve. It's hard to move into something that's already occupied in the niche. It's like trying to move into someone's house when they're living there. But if you end up with the people disappearing, it's easy to move in. So the dinosaurs did not really become very complex, very uh, diverse until after the other animals died out in a mass extinction. A natural one, one that we didn't have anything to do with. We're going to do things a little differently tonight, and part two of Young Scientist Roundtable is going to be held in here. You can have time to go out and have a cookie and come right back, and at 8.10, our earth science will continue. Um, how many fossils of megafauna influence even more than our scientific concepts? Many of our myths and legends of gods, giants, and monsters may stem from ancient discoveries of fossil remains. Now, that's part two. So you will not want to miss the second part. Thank you so much. What a wonderful... Oh, oh thanks. That was... yeah, appreciate it. And as a thank you, the oh. well-known Young Scientist Roundtable, okay. if you see that on someone's desk, okay. you'll know you're in good hands. All right, thank All you right. much. I appreciate so it. So come on back for, and you might be seeing some of these things that we pulled out of the box for part two, okay? Okay.